This video focuses on frequency distributions and percentage distributions as statistical tools that you would use in an applied setting. Once you have a particular question you want to answer within a context where you simply need to run some straightforward analysis to see the patterns in the data to answer a realistic question, then you have to use some sort of approach to make a decision about what tool you use. I showed in a previous video a framework for statistical analysis in applied settings that introduced a way to choose the right tools, introduced a way to see what results you should be looking for after you run those tools, and suggested a way that you might actually write up or present the results so that you can answer the original question. So this is my framework for doing applied statistics, as is fully explained in an earlier video. Now, I'm going to work today with an analysis question that says, do people support current levels of spending on social issues? The data I'm going to use is from a national data set of adults in the United States. It was administered in 2018. It's called the General Social Survey. And specifically, I'm going to work with a series of variables that ask about whether people believe that too much, about the right amount, or too little is being spent on particular issues. So when I look in the code book, and I also did a video earlier that discusses how to do data set work, minimally how to do data set work using JASP, the analysis program I'm using here, and it talked a little bit about code books there. But there's a code book for the general social survey, and here is the portion of the code book that introduces one of the questions I'm going to use in today's example. And this example question starts with a prompt where the interviewer said to the survey respondent, we are faced with many problems in this country, none of which can be solved easily or inexpensively. I'm going to name some of those problems, and for each one I'd like you to tell me whether you think we're spending too much money on it, too little money, or about the right amount. And then there's a series of particular topical issues. The first one is space exploration. And so the person says, first, space exploration. Are we spending too much, too little, or about the right amount on space exploration? And the respondent would say, too little, they'd get a value of one. About right, they'd get a value of two. Too much, they'd get a value of three. Don't know, if they volunteered that, they'd get a value of eight. No answer, they'd refuse to answer, say, I'm not going to answer that question. They'd get a value of nine. Or they were never asked this question in the 2018 general social survey. There were subsamples, and some people were asked a certain set of questions about these issues, and other people in the same year sample were asked a different set of questions that worded things slightly differently. So in the example that we'll see here, in one of the list items that I will show you in a moment, it says, do you think too much about right, too little is being spent on assistance to the poor? But in the other set, they asked, do you think too little, the right amount, too much is being spent on welfare? Now, welfare is a social system meant to help the poor, but people answered very differently depending on which version of the question they got. So this set of questions has some people who were never asked, and they'll have a value of zero. So I went through the code book, and I copied all of the different items out of the code book and put them together in this list. So here are the list of items that people were asked, do we spend too little about right or too much on? Space exploration, the environment, health, assistance to big cities, law enforcement, drug rehabilitation, education assistance to blacks, national defense, assistance to other countries, assistance to the poor. Okay, so our question then has to be put through the framework to figure out what kind of statistical tool we should use to answer it. The question, do people support current levels of spending on social issues, guides us to decide, based on what variables we have and what question we're trying to answer, we will have to decide, are we doing a series of one variable analyses? Are we doing two variable analyses where we are going to have some predictor variable that we believe your answer on that variable helps us to predict what answers you gave on support for current levels of spending on social issues? Or are we doing simple multivariate analyses where we have some kind of predictor, whether you're a male or a female, does that predict for us? Does it matter in terms of how you answered support for current levels of spending on social issues? And 
it adds a control for other things. Well, in this circumstance, huh, let's just jump over here. In this circumstance, uh, we're going to find that we do a one variable analysis. Okay, how did we get to that? Well, there are no predictors. I have a list of variables. I'm going to jump back to that list real quick. When I look at those, I don't really believe that any one of those helps to explain why people answered the others. Oh, it's true. Some of these may be related to each other. People who answered on one of them a certain way, that might actually predict how they answer on something else. But normally we're thinking about predictors or independent variables. We're thinking about do men and women have different views? Do rich and poor have different views? Those kinds of causal agents. Although, mathematically, we're not really checking causation here. That's how we build uh, two variable analyses. So, when we go to ask which one we use, since we don't have any predictors, we go with one variable analyses. That means whatever statistical tool we're going to use, it's going to be in that row of this framework. And then we have to ask, is the variable that we want to run analysis on, the dependent variable, and in this circumstance, because it's one variable analyses, all we have is, in essence, the dependent variable, is it categorical? That is, the level of measurement is nominal or ordinal. Or is the dependent variable scaled? That is, the level of measurement is interval or ratio. Well, all of these questions have the answer choices of too little, about the right amount, and too much. So when we look at that, we say this is categorical. People don't have some scaled answer anywhere on the scale. They either have a 1 or a 2 or a 3. And the categorical answer, if we want to go just a bit further, the categorical answer actually measures amount from less support, too little uh, is spent, to more support, uh, about right, to too much. And so there's, a, there's an order to these. There's no sense in which you could ask these in any order or look at them in any order, and it would make as much sense as the natural order of from less to more. So these are actually ordinal variables. So let's bring up that categorical set of uh, analysis choices. And we now have to choose a tool in that column. Well, if we're doing a one variable analysis and we're using categorical variables, then we're going to do distributions. And in this framework we see, if we're going to do distributions, then we're going to describe shape. We're going to look for trends in the pattern and we're going to look for variation in the pattern. Okay, now that we've identified through the use of the framework, which variables and the research question, which tools they lead us to use. And now we have some idea of what we're trying to do. Let's jump over to the analysis program and see if we can figure out how to run it here. Now, what I have is I have the general social survey in the 2018 version. And the there are 1,000 plus variables in this data set. And I'm going to end up going to the option for descriptive statistics. Now, I actually did this earlier. Let me just push this over and you can see where I went into descriptive statistics and I found those variables that we had just mentioned and I had it run the analysis. Now I could, if I wished, I could get rid of, because I'm not going to use them, I'm not using central tendency here, I'm not using the mean or the me median uh, or the minimum or maximum or the standard deviation, so I could make all those go away. And I am using the frequencies. I can turn that off and turn that on. And so you can see that for each variable now, I, I get a result. Now, I can take all of this, and there are a couple of things I can do. I'm going to choose this little arrow by frequency tables, and I'm going to copy. And I've now copied all of those distributions for each of the individual variables. Now, I can go into a variety of programs. Let me go ahead and open Excel for one example. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to paste it uh, with destination formatting. And it's just going to drop it all in in a clean form with none of the lines, just the actual text. All right. I also can drop it into Word. So here where I have Word and I have. Uh, these variables that we're looking at, 
um, I can get all of the results and I could just drop them into Word this way. All right, and that's, that's where you have to start. If you want to look at an individual table, you can actually do that. Now, I can delete that row and I can delete a whole bunch of things. I can just copy out these rows if I want to just have that part of the table. Uh, I can modify this and make certain words go away uh, so that I can change it. Let me suggest when you actually work with your results that you immediately start looking at things like the name of the variable, V113NATSPACY. And you think, how do I change that so that those cryptic variable names and other cryptic words that I've come across as I do this, how do I change that so that my audience can understand what I was working with? More on that in a second. But having done this, now I can actually look at the results. Here's the results for spending on the space exploration program. All right, what we find is that 264 people gave a value of 1, 515 gave a value of 2, 278 gave a value of 3. 1,291 are in missing, which means they have an 8, a 9, or a 0. And that gives me my 2,348 people that were in the sample. Now, these percent columns in a lot of stats programs actually include in the percentage the missing because it might matter to you that 55% of the sample is missing. If 55% of the people had refused to answer the question, we'd really be worried here because that would suggest we weren't getting a representative measure. But most of this, the vast majority of this 55% here, are people who were never even asked the question. So not a problem, it was part of the intentional design. So of those who were actually asked the question and gave valid answers, 25% said too little, 48.7% said about the right amount, 26.3% said too much is being spent on this. Now, this valid percent is really what most of us care about. This is where we focus and what we look at. When you report this, you don't want to say valid percent unless you're speaking to other people who do this regularly, who are at least statistical technicians or statistical professionals. If there's just some average audience, the word valid helps them not at all. They will assume implicitly that you're only reporting the results that matter, that they are only the valid results. So normally you lose that valid uh, designator on the front of this when you're reporting this to public or general audiences. All right, now what we need to do is we need to figure out how to describe this pattern. If you have, as a general custom in statistics, if you have less than 30 cases, we tend to be pretty skeptical about the use of statistical tools. And if you have roughly 30 or more, we are willing to trust it. There's uh, certain issues of the stability of the mathematical representation of patterns that hinges on having enough cases. Now there are other assumptions about how many cases and where those cases are for some later tools, and we'll bring those up in later videos. But for this one, we just want to say, do we have at least 30 cases that are being spread across the percentages? Well, I've got 264 who said a value of 1, 515 who said a value of 2, 278 who said a value of 3. It doesn't matter if I have 30 in each category. I just need a total 30 what's normally called the N, capital N is the symbol for the number of cases. So I have plenty of cases to be doing percentaging on this variable. And here's the question, what is the shape of this pattern? There is more trend to the extent that more people or a larger percentage of the people chose a particular answer. There is more variation to the extent that there is no trend. So I have 25% saying too little, roughly half, 49%, saying about the right amount, and about a fourth, 26%, saying too much. So what it looks like is the trend is that people tend to say about the right amount is being spent on this. About half of the population, I'm sorry, about half of the sample that we believe represents the population pattern, about half of them said about the right amount. But about a fourth, 
said too little and about a fourth said too much. So I would end up describing this as words as saying the tendency is for people to say that about the right amount was spent on space exploration. But there's polarization to opposite extremes amongst the other half of the respondents, with about a fourth of respondents saying too little is spent and about a fourth of respondents saying too much is spent. So now I've described the trend and I've described the variation. And then I would have to give some numbers to evidence this, right? The five guidelines for describing the patterns in data. First, in words, describe it, which I just did. Second, in with statistical numbers, evidence your claim so that your audience can decide if they agree. I said people tend to say and then they're polarized on. And so I described some patterns. Now, when I give the numbers, if I just round everything up, then I say round everything appropriately using, say, the even round rule. Then if I say 49% said about the right amount is spent, whereas 25% said too little is spent and 26% said too much is spent on space exploration. If that was my second sentence, now people can decide if they agree with my word description. You know, when you're doing distributions, it, it'll be really tempting just to say, well, I don't need to describe this in words. This, these patterns, they, they're obvious from the three numbers. It's just three numbers. And yet you'll have to think about your audience because if your audience doesn't work with numbers regularly, your audience is probably not going to see the pattern as cleanly as you will if you work with numbers more often or if you just have more time to think about this and figure out what you, uh, what you see as a pattern. Now I can go through and I can do that for all of these different variables. And every one of these is a one variable analysis. Nothing here is saying does the pattern in one of these variables mathematically relate to the pattern in one of the other variables. That would be a two variable analysis. Even though I have lots of variables I'm looking at, every one of them is being looked at in a univariate way. Now, I also want to suggest that you might want to do something graphical. You might want to create a bar chart of some sort or some kind of graphic that's appropriate to the kind of results you're dealing with if you're trying to present these results to a general audience who they don't work with numbers often. Because in an applied setting, you're oftentimes speaking to folks who really do want to know what the pattern is because that will inform decisions they're going to make. But just seeing a list of numbers doesn't help them. So here's what I've done. I've created a couple of different graphics. Let me show you how I went about doing that. I took the results and I pasted them into Excel, just like you saw me do a moment ago. Let me jump to the other sheet here and you'll see where I went with that. I took a lot of these columns and I deleted them. So I could just right click this and delete those columns and I could get rid of these columns. And all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to isolate those valid percent numbers. All right. And then I took those valid percent numbers. And so now all I had was in one column, I had the answer options. And in the column beside it, I had the percentage who gave those answers for all of the different, uh, all of the different variables. Then I gave a, an equation that basically said, copy the name over here and then copy these three numbers over here. And I copied and pasted that equation so that it copied those things over. And then I took this whole column and I copied it because it's got a series of pointers. In essence, this is saying, put in here whatever is in this cell over here. But I want it to actually have the number in it. So what I did is I took this whole column and I copied it. And then I came over here, nothing was in the column then. And I did a paste. And when I did the paste, I did the paste with actual numbers instead of doing the paste uh, where it recreates the formulas. Okay, and so now I have a listing here where you can see that when I click on this cell, I actually have a number. Okay, I actually have the percentage. And then I just went through and I copied each of these and I pasted them until I had all of the different variables in the list. And I had the percentage who said, too little, the right amount, and too much, and I copied that. I know, you're thinking, really? Can't the program just do everything for me? Eh, sorry, uh, this, is, this is why they call these things jobs. There's work to be done. <laughs> you get paid to do this, hopefully. All right, and so then I, uh, 
I copied it and I pasted it and there's an option when you paste in Excel and Word and so forth to transpose and it flipped it. So now uh, what was across the columns is now down the rows and now I have a list of the variables and by their names and now I have the actual values of too little, the right amount and too much. Now why did I do all that? Well, let's jump back over to Word here. If I go back up to the top, you'll see that I copied that and dropped it here because I wanted to be able to grab all of this and I wanted to drop it into a chart. So I'm not going to actually go ahead and create a full chart here, but if I choose to insert and I choose a chart and I choose to insert a chart, uh, let's say that we're gonna do that horizontal bar chart and I choose to do this chart type then it's going to give me a place where you have the variable names and then you have the actual about uh, too little about right too much and I could just paste that in so that I could create this chart all right and when I did that I created this chart now I've done a little bit of manipulation I added uh, a legend across, I added a, uh, a caption across the bottom. I moved the legend over to the side. But most importantly, what I did in this, in this particular one is I went into the chart design and I said, edit data in Excel. And I actually took this just like this, just like this. And I sorted this and I sorted it in a custom sort so that I sorted by too little, so that's going to be column B, uh, and I'm going to sort it from smallest to largest. Now I did that because now instead of having them in the order that they are in the data set, and really who cares what order they are in the data set, it's sorted from those that had the smallest percent say too little to the, value, the variable that had the largest percent of people say too little. Now that, creates my uh, that creates this diagram now you can see that too little is in gray about right is in orange and uh, too much is in blue and you can see which variables which issues people didn't send, tended to say was too much was spent and then it's kind of spread evenly and then you can find down at the bottom uh, where people when they're saying uh, too little is being spent okay so this is one example of a graphic you could use. Here's another example. This is called a stacked 100% bar chart. It's just another option that you could, I could literally go into this and I could choose to change the chart type and I could go and I could change the chart type to stacked bar chart and it would look like this. And then I did some manipulation here. I put the legend on the bottom. I put data labels in, right? If you're gonna do this and you're gonna report these things to folks in an applied setting, you need to think about how to make it look good enough that they can see what they're seeing. And now you can really see the movement in terms of the percentage as you go from one variable to another that said too little is spent on it. Too little is spent on education, right? And then too much is spent on um, aid to foreign nations, I believe that says. Right, assistance to other countries. Now, notice what I've done here. I went in, originally the chart just had these cryptic variable names. Well, that's nice, but who knows what those mean? My audience isn't gonna know what that means. So what I did is I went into this, and again, I went into the, uh, the option to, to uh, look at the data in Excel, and I went and I changed the titles, the, the labels for each uh, row, I changed them so that they were the wording from the actual questions. And now I have uh, text that anybody can look at this and they can see how the public views spending on these different issues. And they have it in an order where not only can I see the pattern in any one variable, I can see the pattern across all of these variables where people tended to have one view, where people tended to have another view. All of this is still just using percentage distributions. All of this is still just using one variable analyses. It's just a bunch of them all put together. Okay, so we've got that. 
and uh, I've already shown you that you could just use these tables as well. But now you can see how for a lot of audiences, this might be a lot more helpful to them than just this list like this with no effort to try to clean it up for them. Um, if your job involves doing applied statistics for an audience to understand what's seen in the patterns, then you need to seriously consider how you're going to present the stuff so that people understand why you're saying what you're saying. All right, let me jump to another document here and give you a template for how you might report these results. All right, so here's what you need to do. If you're going to present this, this information has to go in your presentation. If you're going to write this up, it has to go in your report. So in your report, uh, you would need to have some kind of title, ideally. And the title, ideally, is going to make it clear what question is being answered, what is being studied. You could actually title this report something like Views of Spending on Social Issues. And nobody has to go, well, oh, look, it's, you know, uh, conceptual report 7-3b. What is that? Who will remember a week from now what in the world that means? So use a title that your audience understands, that they can go, this is where I'll find the answers to the question I'm asking. You should give an office or a person or some contact information so that whoever's reading this can get back to whoever created it if they have questions. You should give a date because this data from 2018 it's great, but when somebody stumbles on this report uh, in 2025, it's, it's, there's better data. Now, there is no general social survey any newer right now. They only put one out every two years. And so fall of this year, 2020, there will be another one out, and I could start using the 2020 data. But there's no 2019 data from the general social survey. So this is the most recent data. But by having a date on this report, people can understand what they're seeing. Now, five guidelines. One of them is stay true to the cases. So you need to report what the cases are, and you need to, in this report, always talk about the right set of cases. Don't wander off and start mentioning other cases and confusing the audience about what cases you actually have data for. You need to say what the variables are, right? Stay true to the variables. Stay true to the measures. One of the five guidelines for reporting your results. You need to give your findings by describing the patterns in words, and including your statistics as evidence. In my list of guidelines, those are one and two, right? You have to not just give numbers, un unless it's politically untenable to actually describe anything, because in some offices, the reality is that you may be facing um, um, disagreements in the office, and you may not have a lot of power, and you may decide that in that circumstance, I will just give the numbers and try to stay out of the battles about what should be done with program X. Okay, but to the extent that uh, there's not some major political push that is dangerous for you, then describe in words, because most human beings, they understand through words, not just lists of numbers. And that will also guide you in deciding which numbers to bother to report because you'll report the numbers that are necessary for justifying your words and enough numbers that people can see if they agree. So you don't just cherry pick numbers that are only the ones that support. You give enough numbers that anybody can then evaluate if they would have written the same thing that you wrote in terms of describing the pattern and then stop. Don't bury your audience under numbers. If you feel like every single table has to be made available, you have to be utterly transparent, it's a circumstance where that's just wise, then put it all in an appendix to the report. Every single number run is all in the appendix. You can all check it. That would be fine. But in the actual descriptions, give enough numbers that anybody has what they need to describe the patterns and see if they agree with your description. Most of the time, because you're the person who's been assigned to do this, they're just going to go with whatever you say, especially once they come to trust your competence. But once in a while, you may have somebody uh, with greater ability or whatever wanting to read it. And then finally, the fifth guideline is to keep your uh, interpretations separate. So what does this all mean? Why did this all happen? What should we do? What recommendations do we have? None of that follows directly from the empirical data. All of that 
is logically inferred from the patterns in the data. So you need to make sure that you don't mix those all together because then people might look at your results and say, I see you're describing an empirical pattern here. And then you draw a conclusion about what we should do then about program X. And you mix them all together, making it sound like the empirical conclusion is to do this with program X. When in fact, the data only shows what it shows, and then you infer what it means for program X. That's often what we do. Now, that's not to say don't do interpretations, because in fact, that's oftentimes what applied researchers, what applied statisticians are being asked to do. The minute I have groups I work with who are reporting their results in front of some kind of leadership team, the moment that's happening, normally there's somebody in charge who interrupts the presentation to say, well, now wait, so you said this pattern, this pattern. So does that mean we should fire these people? Does that mean we should put more money here? Does that mean <laughs> you're going to be asked? Just make sure that you say, well, here's what we know empirically. And it seems to me that that logically leads us to conclude when we bring other assumptions to bear and other knowledge we may have. So keep interpretations separate. All right. Let me give you an example template of how you might write this. Now, this is just one of dozens of ways you can do it. This example template isn't meant to be some sort of magic template. It's just to say, how are you going to put all those things onto a page in a way that an audience is going to find it engaging and meaningful and helpful? Um, I suggest that you try to look for color or images, logos, something to just not make it seem like just dead text, black and white on the page. But remember that whatever you do here, it's probably going to be printed by some people in black and white. You might want to print the report in black and white and see if, in fact, it's still legible. Uh, I, was, I, I was talking to a person who was actually interviewing me about some research I had been involved in. And, they, and he said, I, all of your bar charts are all in shades of blue. Do you have something against all other colors? And I said, I have nothing against other colors. But if I do my bar chart and it has a red bar and a blue bar and an orange bar and a yellow bar, then when I print it out, I have a black bar, a black bar, a black bar, and a gray bar. And suddenly my legend that says, oh, orange stands for this, blue stands for this, it, it's just black, black, black. And there's no differentiation in color. So do think about what it will look like when it's printed in black and white. And I do encourage you again to use graphics if your audience doesn't regularly work with numbers. So here's an example. I could do this. I could put a title on a page. And the title, again, should be something that implicitly makes clear, really explicit, explicitly makes clear what this report is about. Give an author, give a date. Give an introduction. What is being analyzed? Why is it being done? It might be wise to say, because we were in this circumstance, we ran this analysis so that people a month later, a year later, looking at this don't say, well, that's not the analysis we need. That may be true, but it was the analysis we needed back then to accomplish our task back then. And then people can't miss, it's harder for people to misuse your results to answer other questions at other times. And then I give an example here of providing a sidebar where you give information about the variables and the cases. Really, you should say variables and cases. So this is the 2018 General Social Survey. It was collected by the National Opinion Research Center. They have a website that you can go to to learn all about it. I would say all that here. Um, it basically used a representative sample of adults in the United States, right? That kind of stuff. And then these are the variables that I'm actually looking at. This is the question that was asked, what I showed you earlier, right? This, uh, um, this larger question that was asked. I would, I would give this information, what question was literally asked, how was it asked, what are the, the wordings that are used. This gives me a way to make sure people know exactly what cases are involved here and exactly how the measures were done so there won't be any confusion later where somebody says, you know, I got a, the impression they were asked something else entirely. Don't let people be mis, mistaken in what, in fact, you have data on. Now, you may need a bigger sidebar. You might want to put it someplace else. You may want it on the second page. You may want it as an appendix, but put it somewhere. Um, I have the findings here, two pages worth, whatever it is that does that description in words and providing enough numbers to justify the claims. 
and then I talk about my interpretations. If this, for example, this single page I have here, actually it's a two-page report, I'll show you the second page in a moment, but this report fundamentally is assuming there's very little to report. And then on the second page I have uh, the figure that I put together, and then I have some conclusion, the main points I want to leave them with, and then I have my references. Here's how you find the website for National Opinion Research Center or the website for the GSS. There is one for that as well. Here's where people have reported earlier research findings and informed what we were doing. If you have any references here that undergird your work, you would put them. Now, this may spread across three pages, five pages, whatever it may take. And you may decide to put a graphic on the front page because it will be more engaging and people will look at that and say, well, that's interesting. What is that? Uh, but whatever order you want to put things in, uh, you probably want to think about how you're going to lay this out so that people understand the results. Okay, so what we've done is we've basically tried to understand. We basically tried to understand. I'm going to jump back up here. Let me go all the way back to the front and say what we tried to do is we tried to figure out what tool we were going to use based on the question we were asking and the variables that we were working with. We were doing one variable analysis and we were doing it with categorical data. Okay, And so we did distributions. And based on the fact that we were doing distributions, uh, we needed to describe shape and that's all. And we did the five guidelines in terms of reporting it. Okay, so when you find yourself using distributions, it's one of the simplest tools to work with. That would be the way that you would apply this framework and know that you were supposed to be doing distributions. If you have enough cases, you would use percentage distributions because they're intuitive to people. In our culture in particular, people are used to working with percentages, even if they don't understand how, they, how they're constructed mathematically. They make sense. They get what 50-50 is. So this would be a nice way to report the results and help people to understand from your results uh, in your analysis how to answer questions using a distribution.